Say the line, Bart. A monad is just a monoid in the category of Enophantus. Yeah! If you've ever seen a discussion of monads, you've likely heard this joke crop up before. What does this mean? Is it even valid? What is a monad? Hopefully, by the end of this video, you'll be coming away from this quote with a much deeper understanding of what it's saying, and be able to verify for yourself that this is in fact a true but rather obtuse way of explaining monads. With some luck, you'll even be able to understand that you, yes you do, Vera, have actually already used monads before. This video is primarily made for a programmer or a computer science audience, so you do not need to have a strong foundation in abstract algebra or even a graduate level understanding of category theory to watch and understand this video. So as a result, I am giving you a disclaimer that a lot of the definitions I will show you today are accurate enough for our purposes. This is not a video on category theory, nor is it a tutorial on Haskell. So take the definitions with a grain of salt, because a lot of technical details will be omitted for the sake of brevity. You do not need to know all the technical details of what exactly forms a category to be able to create and use a monad pattern. However, you will need to know the basics. So before you embark on this journey, I want to begin by discussing the origins of this quote to hopefully set up a proper foundation to what it was intended to convey. This particular quote first originates in a blog post by James Urry titled The Brief, Incomplete, and Mostly Wrong History of Programming Languages. Urry attributes the quote to Philip Wadler, however the actual quote more closely resembles a small section found on page 138 of the second edition of Sondra McLean's Categories for the Working Mathematician. So the full quote is a lot more mathematical than a commonly memed quote. All told, a monad in X is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors of X, with product replaced by composition of endofunctors and unit set by the identity endofunctor. For those who don't understand the original quote, this still doesn't really get us any closer to any answers. However, it does tell us a crucial detail. Whatever this quote means, it is a mathematically valid statement. So we know that the quote must be telling us the truth, albeit not very well. Let's begin by highlighting keywords from this quote. You want to know what a monad is. However, it would appear that in order to do this, you need to know what a monoid is. And what the heck does a category mean? And what are endofunctors? So let's briefly examine where all these words come from. So what is a monoid? To answer this, we first need to step back into a simpler, hopefully more familiar territory sets. We need to first consider the world of sets. Now, if you aren't familiar with sets, a set is essentially a collection of familiar things. These things are called elements, and they can be any mathematical object. For example, we get a set of all positive integers. Uh, we can also have a set of all letters, or a set of all arithmetic operations, or even a set of sets. Now, just having a set is not particularly interesting. It would be helpful to define some rules explaining what we can and cannot do with elements in our set. Now let's consider our numbers again. Just having a set of numbers is not really enough for us. We kind of need to do something with them, right? Such as addition or subtraction or multiplication. So let's impose some rules on our sets. Namely, we'll define a function f that takes two elements in our set and returns another element to the set. This is called a binary operation. Binary because it takes two parameters. So an example of function that fits this definition is actually addition over the set of numbers. Additionally, we can notice that when we are working with numbers, we can add or subtract zero. This has no effect on our numbers. We call this element an identity element. So, therefore we have a set, an identity element, and a binary operation. This is, a, is called a monoid. It's just a fancy name for this kind of structure. The integers under addition form a monoid. However, the usefulness of an object like a monoid is that we can use it to describe sets beyond numbers. For example, let's take a cube in space and apply a bunch of rotations to it. We could, if you wanted, consider the rotations as elements of our set. The act of rotating in any direction could be considered the composition of multiple rotations together. This forms our binary operation. Essentially, the elements in our set are functions, indicating rotations, and the binary operation is a bunch of composition. Of course, we also have our identity, and this is simply the act of just not rotating at all. The reason I bring up this particular example is because here we have a set of functions that form a monoid under composition. This particular pattern is critical to understanding why mono monoids are important to understanding monads. Alright, so we've briefly gone over what a monoid is. Now it is time to tackle the other words, mainly what a category and an endofunctor are. Like a set, a category is a collection of objects. However, a category is special because it is actually two sets. We have the initial collection of objects, such as a bunch of sets, and then a collection of functions between those sets, called arrows, or morphisms, or maps. The most simple example is the category set. 
This category is simply made up of a bunch of sets and functions between these sets. For our purposes, this is all a category really is, just a high level description of some data and how to move around it. You could almost think about this like a class, where we define all of our variables at the top and we define all the methods at the bottom. Now, a functor is essentially just a function that takes one category into another. For our intended purposes, a functor is no different to a function. The word endo is simply Greek for within or inside. Essentially, an endo functor is just a mapping from a category into itself. Now that we discuss what a monoid is and covered both categories and endo functors, let's put all three together. The category of endo functors should just be a collection of functions, essentially, which basically map the set of inputs to themselves. If they happen to form a monoid, then that would mean that they have a binary operation that we can perform between these functions to combine them. Since the elements are functions, we could call this operation function composition. If we ensure that we have an identity function, which essentially just does nothing, then we have all of our pieces together. A monoid in the category of endo functors is, for our purposes, nothing more than a collection of functions which all have the same signature that we can compose together. That's literally it. So now that we've gone through and broken down what each of these words mean, we can rewrite our quote to be a more human readable. A monad is a set of functions that transforms a set of data. In particular, this data has a well-defined structure, and a monad is a set of functions that map that data into variations of their original structure via function composition. What's the problem? Now with this in mind, let's try to build monads in actual programs. In this section, we're going to build a variety of different monads in different programming languages. The languages we'll be looking at are Haskell, Rust, and Java. First, we'll start with an example. Suppose we have some container. We will call this our context, C. Inside this context, we have some data, A. Now, we don't care about what this data is, like, at all. We just know that there is data inside our context. If you are stumped for visualization, you could imagine this context like a packet sent across the network, like the internet, and the data is a string containing a message. Now, suppose there was a function that could turn A into B. Again, we don't particularly care what A and B are. Now, we can't apply this function to the data because it is wrapped inside our context. So, how could we apply this function? One simple way is to define a new function, which gives us a new context which has the correct data inside. If you inspect this loop further, you may notice that we actually have sort of a collection of objects, A and B, and a collection of maps between them, mainly F. This forms a category where A, B are in the objects and F is in sort of the set of maps. This would mean that our function is actually a functor, right? Because it maps between categories. In particular, it's an endo functor because it maps from a category to itself. Now, suppose I add a new element, C, and a new function, G, which goes from B to C. In order to go from A to C, I would need to compose both F and G together, G of F. However, now I run into trouble where I can't exactly compose my functions together since they both act on data that is trapped inside of a context. The way we solve this is by allowing the, ourselves the ability to compose functors together. That is, we can define a new functor and compose it with the first one. This operation is not usually called function composition. It is often called bind. So now we've allowed the ability to compose under functors together. This is literally all a monad is in practice, essentially, is a way to transform the internal state of some context without modifying the context itself. Uh, and this is how languages like Haskell perform stateful operations like internal mutability. If we were to imagine this context as a network packet, we have essentially just defined a pipeline where you can internally modify the information inside our packet without changing the packet itself. We're changing, we're just changing the message, we're not changing the wider context. Alright, so let's start to code this all together. The best place to start with monads is in Haskell. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Haskell, don't fear, I'll explain what is necessary. In Haskell, to define a monad, we first need to define some data. We'll call this our context. Then we need to define a way to build values of that type. This is commonly called return. And it's just a function that takes uh, something and wraps it inside of our context. This is kind of like a constructor if context was an object. Finally, we need a way to combine this type with computations over it. We need our bind function. This is a function that takes in our context and then a function from the interior type into a new context. 
and then it returns that new content. So the parentheses simply means that we're defining an operator, so we can basically use infix notation. The real implementation of the monad type class in Haskell is, so don't worry about the last few lines, uh, Haskell has three important monads that are used quite often. These are list, maybe, and io. All three of these will help illustrate how monads can be used to solve programming problems. The maybe type is actually pretty useful. It is defined like this. Now, the syntax might seem a bit overwhelming at first. Don't worry about the deriving portion. That middle bar simply means or. It means that maybe it could be nothing or just a, where a is anything. Now, this is just a is basically like a container for a, whatever a happens to be. Nothing is kind of like none in Python or null in JavaScript. Now, it's time to create a monad by defining the bind operation on our type. What this essentially means is that when we bind a nothing with a function, that function just returns nothing. And when we bind a just value, that function is applied internally to that value. Essentially, the maybe type helps us avoid null checks by only computing values on just types. Well, nothings are just passed all the way up. If this was JavaScript, for example. Bind is essentially just doing this. In fact, JavaScript actually has a bind operator in the language. All right, so let's write this in Rust. Rust enums can form data variables, just like Haskell's data. These brackets are generics, and this essentially means you can use any type inside our option. Now, Rust doesn't exactly give us the tools to define the bind operator. Instead, we have a few methods built in that allow us to transform our options. So for the next few examples, we will use the following functions. So essentially, what these functions do is they take some data and they return an option with possibly different data. For example, suppose I have an option and I want to check if that value is even, or maybe I want to change the type from one to another. Or maybe I have a value and I want to add the length of a string inside another option. You could even nest these together. All of this works because of monads. Java also implements a similar construct called an option. The IO monad allows us to handle interacting with our program in a purely functional way. Essentially, the way the IO monad works is by wrapping our entire program state into a single context. In this context, we have nothing printed to the screen. Then we define a function that takes our context into a brand new context where something is printed to the screen. The IO monad is essentially just a set of functions that allows us to interact with our program through the command line or file system. Suppose we had this function to read the name of a file and print its contents. Those slashes correspond to anonymous functions. They are those lambda expressions in Python if you've ever seen. However, Haskell allows us some syntax here to simplify this kind of operation. We have the do keyword, which saves us a lot of time and headspace. This syntax will become important soon. We can also use monads for error handling. For example, we could define some data type that is either OK or an error. Essentially, this data could be either one of these variants, but not both. Then we just make it a monad by defining the bind operation. This is handy for error handling because it allows us to compose computations and pipe any errors away without having to deal with them explicitly. In fact, this is what Rust does to handle errors. In Rust, we can try to build a similar data type. This is very similar methods to the option T that we talked about earlier. The standard library also comes with a nice trait for handling IO errors, the IO result. In Rust, we don't have the do notation. However, we can use the question mark operator to get something similar. The list type is a pretty commonly used monad. The implementation for list looks something like this. See how this works? Suppose we have the following function, and then we bind it to some simple list. Essentially, we want to apply our function to each element individually, then we flatten that list into one single list. This is the result of doing bind. Now, suppose we had something more complicated, which has nested binds. Once again, we can toss this into a do. Now, in Haskell, this actually has a shorthand, and it is called list comprehension. Now, Haskell isn't the only one with list comprehensions. Python allows for list comprehensions as well. So in Python, we have a for loop we're appending to this list we can essentially replace this for uh, actually writing that for loop for in syntax inside the list itself. This is called a list comprehension in Python, and it acts exactly the same way in Haskell. This is also shorthand for using, composing this list, this map, and this range function. In fact, you can nest multiple list comprehensions and even add condition checks. If you want to, you could even build a matrix with them. They even work for other data structures list comprehension, set comprehensions, dictionary comprehensions, and generator. You can even use them to build strings. For example, here's a snippet of building a pretty printed JSON string from some Python objects. We can also see similar concepts in Rust through the iterator tree. Instead of writing the vectors and pushing to them explicitly, we can write it with iterators like this. Now, we can use all three of these monads, this option, this iterator, and this result, to do some multi-threading. In this code, we loop from 0 to 10, create a thread in each 
inside each thread, we loop from 0 to 10 and print that number along with the thread number. And then we join all those threads together. And then finally, we combine all our results. In Java, we actually have a similar construction, except in this case, we would use the stream API. A Java stream essentially wraps a collection inside of a mode net, so we can safely iterate over it. This code iterates over our list and then just creates a new list. All right, so now for the big guy. How would we build a monad in Java? A language doesn't even allow for first class functions. Well, it's simple. Don't use Java. All jokes aside, we could get a bit creative with this. Instead of showing you how to build a monad in Java, I will just show you how the object-oriented design patterns that you all know and love are actually monads. Now, there are a lot of design patterns, so I'll only focus on one. Today, we'll be focusing on the builder pattern. So for those who don't know what the builder pattern is, let me explain it briefly. The builder pattern is an object-oriented design pattern that allows us to abstract the creation of an object. This is usually used when you have a very complex object that could have many different representations. Essentially, instead of creating this complex object directly, you will instead create an intermediate object. This object's entire purpose is to allow us to essentially describe what we want our more complicated object to look like. So here's an example using Java string builder class to build a string value. So let's think about what this pattern is actually doing. For starters, you have a seemingly complex object and we know that it has a lot of objects and methods and we want to be able to take some representation of this object and be able to map from one representation to another. Finally, we want to be able to take these mappings between representations and compose them together to create more complicated representations. Well, if our complex object forms a category, and the mappings between its representations are just endofunctors. And since we can compose all of these mappings together, this must mean that they form a monoid under composition, which as a result means that our builder object is essentially just encapsulates a monad. So what have we learned? We started by learning what a monad is in the abstract sense. Then we broke that definition down into a more simpler, more intuitive explanation for changing data inside some wider context. We then took a look at monads in practice and came to realize that a lot of things we take for granted in programming, such as loops and error handling, can actually be described in terms of monads. We also took a look at how purely object-oriented design patterns can form monads. Hopefully this helps to demystify monads and maybe you know enough to actually be able to build your own in practice. Although as it turns out, you probably already have, you just never realized it. This video was made in part mainly for 3 blue one brown summer math exposition competition and this does an entry. The other part of this video is to test the waters and see if my audience would enjoy a few explainers here and there. The memes won't stop uploading either if you like those. I just want to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed within the past few weeks. Literally three weeks ago I had like four subscribers and have basically given up YouTube entirely. I'm so grateful to everyone who has subscribed and been active on the community polls and the discord. Make sure to like and subscribe for more of these uh, I suppose.